Hello and welcome to the ASCO Guidelines podcast series brought to you by the ASCO Podcast Network, a collection of nine programs covering a range of educational and scientific content and offering enriching insight into the world of cancer care. You can find all the shows, including this one, at ASCO.org slash podcasts. My name is Brittany Harvey, and today I'm interviewing Dr. Lynn Henry from University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, Michigan, lead author on Biomarkers for Systemic Therapy and Metastatic Breast Cancer, ASCO Guideline Update. Thank you for being here, Dr. Henry. Thank you very much for inviting me to participate. First, I'd like to note that ASCO takes great care in the development of its guidelines and ensuring that the ASCO conflict of interest policy is followed for each guideline. The full conflict of interest information for this guideline panel is available online with the publication of the guideline in the Journal of Clinical Oncology. Dr. Henry, do you have any relevant disclosures that are related to this guideline topic? No, I do not. Great. Thank you. Then let's talk about the scope of this guideline. So, What prompted this update to the guideline on the use of biomarkers to guide decisions on systemic therapy for patients with metastatic breast cancer, which was last updated in 2015? And what is the scope of this guideline update? Yeah, so a lot has happened in the past six or seven years that influence how we treat metastatic breast cancer. And there are many new drugs that have been approved by the FDA during that time. When we reviewed the prior guideline and the new treatment landscape, we realized that while much of what was included in the old guideline was still relevant, there were quite a number of new biomarkers related to new drugs that needed to be included. The newly recommended biomarkers are primarily applicable to making decisions about treatment of estrogen receptor, progesterone receptor, and HER2 negative breast cancer, also called triple negative breast cancer, as well as for treatment of hormone receptor positive HER2 negative breast cancer. And finally, there are now some tumor biomarkers that can be tested for that are tumor agnostic, and these were included as well. Great. So then let's discuss the updated guideline recommendations based off these new biomarkers for our listeners. The guideline reviews testing for several different biomarkers, so I would like to review each of the biomarkers that the panel assess. So let's start with what is the role of PIK3CA mutation testing? Yeah, so PIK3CA activating mutations are commonly found in tumors that are hormone receptor positive and HER2 negative. Based on the results of the SOLAR1 trial, patients whose tumors have an activating PIK3CA mutation had improved progression-free survival when treated with the PI3 kinase inhibitor alpalisib plus fulvestrant compared to fulvestrant alone. This improvement was not seen in patients whose cancers didn't have a mutation. So therefore, this provided the evidence for clinical utility of evaluating tumors for somatic PIK3CA mutations. Testing of either a tumor specimen or plasma to look for PIK3CA mutations can be performed. However, it's important that if the plasma is tested and no PIK3CA mutations are identified in the circulating tumor DNA, then a tumor specimen should really be tested if possible because of the possibility of a false negative finding in the plasma. Also, since these mutations can be acquired over time, a more recent specimen should be tested if possible, as opposed to testing the primary tumor. Finally, in the SOLAR1 trial, a patient's tumor had to have one of 11 pre-specified PIK3CA mutations in exon 7, 9, or 20. And therefore, when mutations are identified using next-generation sequencing, it is important to confirm that the identified mutation is one of those 11 activating mutations and not a different one that may not convey benefit from treatment with a PI3 kinase inhibitor. Great. Appreciate you reviewing that recommendation as well as the clinical utility of it and the evidence behind it. So then following those recommendations, what is the role of testing for ESR1 mutations? At this time, there are insufficient data to support routine testing of metastatic hormone receptor positive HER2 negative tumors for ESR1 mutations. However, the panel did note that there's retrospective analysis of two different phase three trials that demonstrated that fulvestrin improved progression-free survival compared to the aromatase inhibitor exemestane in patients who had previously progressed on a non-steroidal AI and whose tumors had an ESR1 mutation. Importantly, there are ongoing clinical trials addressing this issue, including the PADA-1 trial, which is evaluating the effect of the switch from fulvestrin from aromatase inhibitor therapy versus remaining on that therapy when ESR1 mutations are detected in the blood. However, although preliminary findings were presented at a recent large breast cancer meeting and were suggestive of a possible progression-free survival benefit from switching therapy, data have not yet been published and therefore they were not included in this guideline. Great. So we'll look forward to those updated data to potentially review that recommendation in the future. 
So following those recommendations, what is the role of testing for germline BRCA1 or 2 and PALB2 pathogenic mutations? So the answer for germline BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutations is relatively straightforward. Patients with metastatic HER2 negative breast cancer can be either hormone receptor positive or negative, and who are candidates for treatment with a PARP inhibitor should undergo testing for germline BRCA1 and BRCA2 pathogenic or likely pathogenic mutations to determine whether they should receive treatment with a PARP inhibitor. This recommendation is based on the results of two large randomized clinical trials comparing PARP inhibitor therapy to physician's choice chemotherapy, although notably the chemotherapy options did not include taxanes, anthracyclines, or platinums. In contrast, there remains insufficient evidence to support a recommendation either for or against testing for a germline PALB2 pathogenic variant for the purpose of determining eligibility for treatment with a PARP inhibitor. The panel did note, however, that there are small single-arm studies that show that there are high response rate to PARP inhibitors in patients with metastatic breast cancer encoding DNA repair defects, such as either germline PALB2 pathogenic variants or somatic BRCA1 or 2 mutations. It was also noted that it is likely that patients who harbor mutations in these genes will actually be identified through routine testing with panel testing for germline variants. Okay, understood. So then following those recommendations, what is the role of testing tumors for homologous recombination deficiency? So although there are emerging data from other solid tumors to support the use of homologous recombination deficiency or HRD testing to guide therapy, current data do not support the assessment of HRD in the management of metastatic breast cancer. Therefore, we did not recommend routine testing of tumors for HRD at this time. Uh, It's important to note where we both have evidence and where we don't have evidence. So then what is the role of testing for expression of PD-L1 in metastatic breast cancer? So the panel recommends that patients who are candidates for treatment with immunotherapy with either a PD-1 or PD-L1 inhibitor should undergo testing for expression of PD-L1 in the tumor and immune cells with an FDA-approved test. At present in the United States, pembrolizumab is the only approved immunotherapy for treatment of metastatic breast cancer, and it is given in combination with chemotherapy. The FDA-approved test for this drug is the 22C3 assay, which evaluates pd one staining in the tumor and surrounding stroma to calculate a combined positive score, or CPS, with positive considered to be a score of 10 or greater. Of note, in other countries, there are different anti-PD-1 and PD-L1 antibodies that are approved for treatment, and each has been approved with its own companion diagnostic. So it is important to make sure that you're using the right biomarker test, depending on which drug you are planning to use. Great. I appreciate you reviewing the test in addition to the role of the biomarker. So then following those recommendations, what is the role of testing for deficient mismatch repair microsatellite instability high? Similar to PDL1 testing, it is recommended that patients with metastatic breast cancer who are candidates for a treatment regimen that includes an immune checkpoint inhibitor should undergo testing for deficient mismatch repair or microsatellite instability high to determine eligibility for treatment with one of the drugs that is currently FDA approved, either dostarlamab or pembrolizumab. In contrast to the PDL1 data, however, There are no randomized studies that have been conducted specifically in patients with breast cancer addressing this question. The testing recommendation was therefore included in these guidelines because of the tumor agnostic FDA approval of these drugs. In terms of which biomarker methodology to use, it was noted that while the original studies assessed the deficient mismatch repair and MSI high using immunochemistry and PCR respectively, The FDA has subsequently approved a next-generation sequencing platform for use in selecting candidates for these treatments, and so therefore there are a number of different tests that can be used. Thank you for reviewing those recommendations as well. So then following, what is the role of testing for tumor mutational burden? So tumor mutational burden describes the quantity of somatic mutations in the tumor. Similar to the biomarkers we were previously discussing, There are minimal data specifically in metastatic breast cancer to support assessment of tumor mutational burden for making treatment decisions. However, the testing recommendation was again included in the guidelines because of the tumor agnostic FDA approval of the drug pembrolizumab in the setting of high TMB. And also there is one single arm phase two trial that looked at this specifically. Importantly, the panel noted that there are a variety of factors that influence assessment of TMB. These include sample type, pre-analytical factors to how the the sample was handled, 
size of the panel of mutations that are tested, depths of the sequencing, type of the mutations that are included on the panel, and cut point variables. So in particular, assessment of TMB in cell-free DNA assays, such as circulating tumor DNA, is an area of evolving evidence. There are therefore very important caveats to be aware of when selecting a TMB assay and assessing the results, many of which are outlined in the guideline manuscript itself, and different assays can yield different results for the same tissue specimen. It is therefore very important to use the approved companion assay and the approved cut point when making decisions regarding a specific treatment. Absolutely, and I appreciate you reviewing those details. So then what is the role of testing for neurotrophic tyrosine receptor kinase? So I'm going to abbreviate that to NTREC. So NTREC fusions are rare in metastatic breast cancer. One study said it's 0.39% of all breast cancers have NTREC fusions. So as with the above biomarkers, the NTREC testing recommendation is based on the results of phase one and phase two studies that were identified by the panel evaluating the efficacy and safety of these inhibitors for the treatment of advanced solid tumors with NTREC gene fusions, noting that there are only minimal data available that are specific to metastatic breast cancer. Understood. Some of these are very rare in metastatic breast cancer. So then... Following that recommendation, what is the role of using circulating tumor DNA? So for circulating tumor DNA, although the ctDNA technology holds promise in metastatic disease for its ability to potentially identify tumor-specific mutations that are shed into the blood and that may be targetable, to date, neither the measurement of changes in ctDNA as a marker of treatment responsiveness nor identification of specific mutations in the blood to direct therapy has actually been prospectively shown to improve patient outcomes compared to standard imaging-based detection of tumor progression. Therefore, at present, the guideline does not recommend routine assessment of ctDNA for monitoring response to therapy among patients with metastatic breast cancer, although many studies are underway evaluating this question. Understood. And then the last biomarker that the panel assessed in this guideline update, what is the role of using circulating tumor cells? Similar to circulating tumor DNA, there are insufficient data to recommend routine use of circulating tumor cells to monitor response to therapy among patients with metastatic breast cancer. To date, studies that have examined the clinical utility of this marker to determine the optimal time for treatment change have not led to improvements in outcomes in metastatic breast cancer. Great. Well, thank you for reviewing all of these recommendations. The panel certainly took on a lot of biomarkers and performed a critical review of all the evidence to make recommendations in this setting. So in your view, Dr. Henry, what is the importance of this guideline update and what should clinicians know as they implement these updated recommendations? Yeah, that's an excellent question. So this guideline addresses the key questions that we face as we're making decisions about how best to treat patients with metastatic breast cancer. Importantly, the guideline highlights the current state of the science with a focus on the available published data from randomized clinical trials. It also discusses limitations of our current knowledge, as well as key considerations for different biomarkers. Of course, we recognize that there are new data emerging on a regular basis, and the panel therefore also highlighted where data are anticipated but not yet available, as well as key questions which we hope will be able to be addressed in the more distant future. And then finally, how will these guideline recommendations affect patients with metastatic breast cancer? Yeah, so really that is the bottom line, isn't it? So ideally, this guideline will enable dissemination of best practices in terms of biomarker selection and analysis to guide clinicians as they are making treatment decisions in conjunction with patients. Treatment of metastatic breast cancer has become more complex with regimen selection affected by both inherited germline genetics and somatic changes in the cancer that can evolve over time. The assessment of relevant biomarkers should allow patients to receive the optimal therapies that are most likely to be effective based on the individual characteristics of their cancers. Well, I want to thank you so much for reviewing this guideline with me today and all of the recommendations and our gaps in evidence for our listeners. Thank you for your work on this guideline update, and thank you for your time today, Dr. Henry. Yeah, thank you so much. And thank you to all of our listeners for tuning in to the ASCO Guidelines podcast series. To read the full guideline, go to www.asco.org slash breast dash cancer dash guidelines. You can also find many of our guidelines and interactive resources in the free ASCO Guidelines app available in iTunes or the Google Play Store. If you have enjoyed what you've heard today, please rate and review the podcast and be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. The purpose of this podcast is to educate and to inform. 
This is not a substitute for professional medical care and is not intended for use in the diagnosis or treatment of individual conditions. Guests on this podcast express their own opinions, experience, and conclusions. Guest statements on the podcast do not express the opinions of ASCO. The mention of any product, service, organization, activity, or therapy should not be construed as an ASCO endorsement.